Hi, I'm your host Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Team Tuesday this week with Omar Perez. Hey, Omar. Welcome back. Hi, Vasco. Nice to be back. Absolutely. So, Omar, we'll talk about teams in a second. But first, share with us, what's the book that most influenced you in your career as a Scrum Master? It's actually an audiobook. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like most books, when popular, they're made into recorded into audiobooks. But in this case, the audiobook came first, I believe. And then a transcript was made of that into a book. It's called Beyond the Phoenix Project by Gene Kim and John Willis. Not to be confused with the Phoenix Project, which is a business novella that describes like a you know a situation. So why do I like this book? Why has it influenced me so much? Because it lays on all in a conversational manner which makes it more accessible, I believe, for people like me, you know, Um, all the foundations in which DevOps and by extension Agile um, stand, you know. So it's a little bit like the Newtonian physics, if you want, of of what I believe that my Agile practice is based on. And you may ask, who is Newton? Who is our Newton? For me, without any doubts, in my opinion, it's Edward Deming. Wow. Well, that's not too often that Deming gets a quote here on the podcast. So I'm going to... Amplify that because Deming has a lot to teach us. Uh, so walk us through some of the things in your mind that you you think uh, Scrum Masters uh, can expect to get out of that book. Like what are some of the key things that that they should look for? Well, um, some of them are, are very theoretical, but it's good to understand them from a, because sometimes when you read the sources, they're kind of dry. So they're hard to digest for Scrum Masters. For example, systems thinking or theory of constraints or or even lean thinking. Uh, so it goes over that. And sometimes, you know, a way of better understanding that it's understanding the historical background, you know, who this person was, what what his uh, mission was, you know, uh, during World War II, and then what happened after World War II when he was kind of exiled in Japan, so to speak. So the history, when you sometimes you read the history of uh, of the authors that in which you base our practice, you learn so many things because you understand how things were before, you know, and how in a certain way, Agile was a revolution or Agile and Lean were a revolution. And of course, uh, the, the famous PDCA, you know, uh, cycle, you know, plan, do, check, act, or iterative, you know, development. And he even also uh, speaks about our uh, psychological safety. We always think of psychological safety to Amy Edmondson, you know, and, and the famous, you know, Harvard Business Review. Uh, but that's very recent. That was maybe in the last 10 years. But he also talks about, you know, he's an engineer, Deming. He's associated with, with manufacturing, with lean. But he also talks about the importance of psychological safety. So I think it just, it's a massive foundation for us. Absolutely. And uh, for those of you who like dry books, Out of the Crisis is a classic that is definitely worth uh, reading through. It It is not necessarily easy to read, but it is a, a great book. And uh, for those that are probably not inclined to read boring books, then uh, here's the recommendation by Omar, Beyond the Phoenix Project. I'll put the link on the show notes so that people can easily find it. So Omar, uh, of course, all of these foundations we were just talking about are kind of the the, the models, the tools, the, the aspects we consider when working with teams, because at the end of the day, Scrum Masters succeed through the success of their teams. And uh, because of that, it's important that we recognize some of those patterns that start emerging in a team and then, you know, explode and become a problem for the team. So tell us that story. Tell us the story of a team and, you know, a little bit of the context, and then walk us through what were those small, little, you know, even subtle signs of problems that eventually then grew up and became a big problem for the team. Well, in this case, uh, it was by design. But imagine typical fixed scope, fixed price, fixed time project. You know, <laughs> we were in. It was I was working for a financial services institution that got into this partnership with another one, and we were supposed to build a product for them. And when I say fixed time, means that for every day we delayed our delivery, we were penalized by contract. You know, I had to pay a hefty fees, you know, for every day. So you can imagine the pressure we were under. Needless to say, we were understaffed. And no one had consulted us when negotiating the contract. No one had consulted us on the feasibility, on, on nothing. It was all done uh, behind closed doors. So you can imagine all the patterns that appear, like a lot of... Uh, uh, 
like finger blaming, uh, suboptimal uh, quality, you know, a lot of tech debt, you know, uh, from the beginning, from the onset. Uh, it's it's mode- funny how in these projects, the pressure starts immediately, right? Especially because it's in the contract. So we, we already start the project with this impending sense of doom, right? Like something is going to go bad and the contract is there to kill us at the end. Yeah, they use this word, which I personally dislike, which is a death march. So there was a clear example of, of a death march. So the tensions in the team were getting unbearable. And uh, they didn't even listen to, I was more of a, like, uh, as my wife used to say, as a cheerleader to the team, I was more working on the motivational side of, of things, trying to keep the morale up because all the you know environment was working against us. But there was a breakthrough. That there was a breakthrough, and that's what I would like to share with you. And uh, some people may question the ethics of that, but I think it was the right uh, breakthrough. So basically, um, I so one of the in one of the retrospectives, one of the team members used uh, came up with the suggestion: Why don't we hack the system? And you know, being like IT people, you know, geeky people, the love the word hacking just evokes on them a lot of energy. So said, okay, let's reframe the thing instead of like being this. Uh, complaints and, and crimes and about what, you know, how the world is against us, let's reframe it. How can we hack the system? So you may ask, what what does that mean in this context? Well, we access the contract because we've never seen the contract and we read all the like high level description of what we're supposed to deliver. So we said we will like literally deliver, you know, by the date, whatever is specified here, but we will not add any value to whatever specified over there. So, you know, we will Just contractually... This- yeah, you follow the letter of exactly. But some people even took it, you know, farther. Like our front end developer, he said, "I'm going to conjure myself to do the worst, the ugliest, you know, user interface I've done in my career." You know, just as a revenge. You know, as the revenge of the, of the developers, and he did. You know, and we were all voting. Said, "Okay, you can make that uglier. You can make it. so the, the, <laughs> the screen review sessions were." fun because we were just challenging him or each other on how could we make things like uh, uglier or less um, um, usable, you know, less intuitive for end users. Because of course, they never brought end users to test it. It was just us meeting with ourselves. There were more lawyers than developers involved in this project. You know, that was the systemic, you know, problem from the onset. So uh, for me, it, it was great. And the suggestion came from the team. I didn't, you know, it was spontaneous. I just that's, encouraged them. Actually, that's an important aspect. Uh, and, and it's great that you highlighted it because the suggestion coming from the team means that now they have a motivation to do something, right? Like it was not, oh, let's try to hack the system. And the team goes like, we don't care, like why? And so on and so forth. But the fact that the team took ownership and actually went and read the contract and figured out exactly what is the minimum that they need to do in order to be in line with the contract, but not necessarily deliver anything else. I think that that is a, a, a great story of creating motivation. Now, of course, it's not a positive outcome, right? Like when you look at, you know, whoever was paying for it, uh, uh, maybe they were happy enough. I don't know. You didn't share that, but it was definitely not a positive outcome, but it was something the team found motivation in. And this is one of the things that I, I very often talk about when, when we talk about like, you know, what drives teams and so on. And sometimes what drives team is really like this external enemy, right? Like in this case, it was the customer who became the enemy and we're going to do exactly what they say and we're going to follow exactly the contract, but nothing else, right? So how did the project end though? I'm, I'm sure it wasn't necessarily an easy thing to sell forward. Um, well, first, you know, we came up with this word, you know, MVP, everyone's familiar with that, minimum viable product. We created with, uh, we, we came up with UVP, the ugliest viable product, no? So it was like an internal joke, a motivational, you know, uh, prompt. So um, again, it was a project, it was contractually, but as you know, you know, software products cannot be uh, designed as projects because after that, you know, the, the end users with whom we never interacted, they wanted more or they wanted things to be, be done more efficiently or more options. So the contract was extended and they did listen to us a little bit better. So, so all I'm saying is that what a project became a product and then contractually, you know, we were like, uh, we had more leeway, you know, to, to be a normal team and, and a sustainable, you know, development. So he had a happy ending, if you want. Absolutely. And, and uh, uh, a happy and funny ending yeah. in the end, because the, even though you, 
you strive to deliver the UVP or ugliest viable product, the customer still wanted more. And by the way, that's exactly how it is. That's exactly how it is. Even when you deliver something that you're not proud of, somebody will use it, get some value out of it, even pot potentially even unexpected value out of it, and then want some more. And uh, that, that, that switch from project to product is actually very important because software is not uh, easily fit into the project framework. And the way we could um, see that evolution, it's because of, of the stakeholder uh, composition. At the beginning, as I said, the ratio of developers to like lawyers and managers was like totally unbalanced. But in the second half of the project, you know, when it became a product, most of the lawyers disappeared from the scene and most of the managers, and it was mostly like end users and, uh, and, and developers and tech people. Who actually like it talk. should be. Like yeah, like it should be. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Omar. Tuesday is team day here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. But tomorrow we talk about something that goes beyond the work we do with the teams. We will talk about how to lead change and what our guests have learned from leading and participating in change programs during their career. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.